one change that I want to make from yesterday, which I think is going to be helpful for us, um, is I kind of want to number each of these steps that we do when we are defining a new class. Um, because as we're going to see today, the order in the code is not the same as the order in which we complete them. So I don't want that to be lost. So let's, all, we're, all I really want to do is just kind of rephrase this first line here. Um, I'm going to replace it and just label it number one. It's the first thing we did yesterday. Define methods by specifying. And leave everything else the same. Just to make it clear, like that's the first step. So a little bit of review of yesterday. What we focused on yesterday was once we had discussed and figured out the behaviors of our class, let's define or at least declare those methods. And when we declare the method, we focus on the visibility in general, our methods are public, so code and other classes can access them. We specify the type of the returned value if the method returns a value. If it doesn't, we specify void. We have our method names, which always start with verbs. Um, they're like actions. Um, and then we always have the parentheses, and if additional information is needed, we specify those parameters and their types. So. We're still not implementing any code inside these curly brackets beyond what's needed to make it compile at this point. So that's where we are so far. Um, do, do, do. Next step then is going to be, um, step two is going to focus now on the attributes of the class. So in the course of that conversation we had with the other software teams and what this class needs to do, we identify the attributes of our car class. Some of the attributes, I think, are um, more apparent than others. So for example, we have a method get fuel and tank. We're going to need an attribute, which is how much fuel is in the car's tank. Um, we have some very clear accessor and mutator methods here to get and set the VIN. We're definitely going to need an attribute that stores the car's VIN. Um, some attributes are a little bit more subtle. We have this drive method, where we specify how far we've driven. This class is really built around reporting how much fuel is left in the tank. Um, if we account that the car is driven a certain distance and we need to subtract a certain amount of fuel, we need to know the fuel efficiency of the car. So there's another instant, another attribute we're going to need that may not be immediately apparent. Um, when someone opens up our class to read our class definition, they're going to expect at the top of the file, still inside the car class here, so inside this curly brackets, but right at the top, this is where they're going to expect to find what the attributes, which in Java we call instance variables. So I'm going to make another slash star comment block here, and we're going to define what an instance variable is. So this is step number two. Step number two is to define the instance, ins, instance variables. The instance variables store. Um, this is where this is where we store the objects' attributes. So we've been using the more generic term attributes in Java. We call these instance variables. So let's be clear what we need to specify when we um, define our instance variables. We need to specify the visibility. Visibility. Our instance variables are usually private. That's part of data encapsulation. That was one of the concepts we discussed a little bit yesterday. We don't want code in other classes to directly be able to access and change our instance variables. We want them to always go through the methods that we define instead. Um, in the context of this course, we have two options for visibility. Um, and we've seen them both now. Public, which is what most of our methods are, public means um, either the instance variable or the method or the class, any of these things that get labeled with a visibility. Public means it's accessible by any code in any class. Okay. We want, in general, we want our methods to be public. Private means it's only accessible by methods in this class, which is exactly what we want for the instance variables. Certainly we want our code to be able to access the instance variables, we, in this class. We just don't want code outside of this class to do so. So we always specify that first, the visibility. Then we specify the type of the instance variable. Um, is it a turtle? Is it a string? For example, a couple of our instance variables are going to be of, uh, have a double type. They need to be able to store fractional 
gallons, for example. And the last thing we specify um, is the name. Um, so for example, it might be uh, fuel efficiency as an example. So let's, let's define the instance variables that we need for our car class. Um, one that I mentioned, so again, first we start with visibility, it's private. The type of this one is going to be a double, and this is going to be our fuel efficiency. And we're going to measure, I'm going to put a little end of line comment here to specify the units for our own benefit in units of miles per Instance variables don't get documented like our methods do because they're not public. People who are using our code, they don't need to know. And it's not really helpful for them to know which instance variables we have. They just care about our public interface, the public methods. All right, so there's our fuel efficiency. Um, another one we talked about was we need to keep track of how much fuel is in the tank. A double is appropriate for that. We could have fractional gallons of gas in the tank. So we'll call this fuel in tank in units of gallons. And the last thing we need to keep track of um, is, the, is the VIN, the vehicle identification, which is a string because it's got letters and numbers in it, so a string is a reasonable way to store that. I'm going to put a little comment here to remind us that um, VIN stands for vehicle identification. VIN is an acronym. Often we capitalize acronyms. We do not want to capitalize this instance variable, however, um, because that would imply, thinking back to our last unit, that it was a constant. Okay? And we're not treating it as a constant. So we'll still use the acronym. We'll just make it all lowercase. So. so it's worth pausing for a moment and comparing and contrasting the two types of variables we've now seen. So in the first unit, we focus solely on local variables, variables that we would define within the context of a method, and we could use throughout that method. Right? Um, these are instance variables. They're not defined in a method. Right? They're defined inside of a class. Here's the opening curly bracket for our class, but they're not defined in, inside of a method. Um, so that's an important difference. And, and really, the whole idea of the instance variable is remember, quite literally, um, back to our physical model, when we think of the sheet of paper that represents an object in the computer's memory, these three instance variables are what we would write on the sheet of paper. We would write fuel efficiency, fuel and tank, VIN. We would write their values next to them. And those values for these instance variables, it's remembered. It doesn't go away when a method finishes. Okay? This is remembered for the lifetime of the object. These values will store in fuel efficiency, fuel and tank, VIN, remain until the object goes away. Okay? That's, the, that's the value of having instance variables. That's what we want our properties to be. And so therefore, the, the term we use is we say the scope of these instance variables is for the entire class, meaning in any of these methods, we can access these instance variables, get their values, change their values throughout any of this code. That's the whole point of having them. Um, we call them instance variables because they relate to an instance of the car class. So instance and object are kind of like synonyms. We could say, I create an, um, a car object, or we could say, I create an instance of the car class. It means the same thing. So that's where the term instance comes from. So let's do a little compare and contrast here with this comment block here um, about instance variables, because I don't want you to be surprised. So instance variables differ from differ from local variables in the following ways. So what I've got here for you are two rules and one best practice. The first rule, or the first like just it's just true, I guess. Instance variables are scoped to the class. And what I mean by that is they are accessible in all methods of the class, and their lifetime 
is the same as the, it's going to get too long, it's the object. And their lifetime is the same as the object. So that's what I was talking about in terms of we can access these instance variables in any method. The values we store are remembered. These, these variables don't go away until the entire object goes away. Huge difference there. That's kind of the whole point of these. Um, the second one is more subtle, but it can lead to uh, surprise at times. Instance variables, unlike local variables, are automatically initialized to a default value. What that default value is depends upon the type of the instance variable. If it's an int or a double, that default value is zero. If it's a Boolean, the default value is false. If the variable is of a class type, that is it stores a reference to an object, we don't have an object yet, so it's given a value of null. Null means there is no object reference. It's a null reference. Even though our instance variables are automatically initialized in this way, in a moment we're going to see like we're still going to always explicitly initialize them ourselves to make it clear to others that we these values are a conscious decision. Like we want it to have this default value. The last thing here is a best practice. So it is considered best practice. Best practice is not to immediately initialize instance variables. And what I mean by that is if you'll notice where we declared our instance variables here, we specified the visibility, we specified the type, we specified the name. It is not followed by equals some value. Okay? Usually, like if you think back to the code we wrote in the last unit and with our local variables, we'd say things like turtle crush equals new turtle. We'd immediately initialize the variable crush to a reference to a new turtle. Or we'd say like int y equals 7 or whatever. Um, we initialize variables right away. We don't have to, but we usually did. Um, we don't do that from a best practice perspective with instance variables. So we wouldn't say like fuel efficiency equals 30 or fuel and tank equals 0 or something like that. Um, the reason why, why is, is beyond the scope of this course, which I hate like justifying things that way, but basically um, we're going to initialize them later in the constructor, which we're about to explore. Um, and the reason for that is for in more complicated situations than this, um, their issues can develop if we initialize our instance variables here instead of in the constructor. So I just wanted to help you develop good habits and follow best practices. So we will always initialize our instance variables within the constructor instead, which we're about to write. So I know that's not a super satisfying answer. So that's step two. Okay. Step one, we defined our methods, at least declared our methods. Step two, we defined our instance variables. Step three um, is to initialize our object. So when we make a new object, we got to make sure everything is set up the way we want it to be for a brand new object. Okay. Think about when you make a new turtle, all the stuff that has to happen. right? The turtle's position has to be set. Its orientation has to be set. Its pen width, its pen color. All that stuff has to be set. We have to do the same thing from our, for our car. Fortunately, our car is a little bit more straightforward. So when someone reads our code, they expect to find the instance variables at the top of the class. They expect to find the methods at the bottom of the class. And between the two is where they expect to find what we call the constructors. Okay? So we're going to add step three here, slash star enter three. Define the constructor or constructors. We can have more than one. In fact, we will in this case. Constructors are have some things that are similar to methods, but they're not really methods. They definitely have some unique um, syntax and, and behavior. So let's kind of start at a high level. Like, what's the point of a constructor? The, the whole point of the constructor is the constructor is responsible for initializing newly created objects. That's the whole point. Right? So in our case, our constructor is going to be responsible for initializing a new car object. What's the default fuel efficiency? How much gas is in the tank? What is the default VIN number? Things like that. This is the first we've talked of constructors. 
but we've created lots of different types of objects in the last unit. We created turtles and worlds and rectangles and randoms. Um, but we didn't talk about constructors. So how does this all connect? This is part of what makes constructors special. Um, constructors are invoked automatically via the new operator. So last unit, when we said crush equals new turtle, by saying new turtle, it automatically called the constructor for the turtle class. And okay, that's just the way that the Java runtime operates when we can create new objects. So that's, that's a little bit different. In order for this all to work in Java, there are certain rules we have to follow. Okay? The first is that the name of the constructor must match exactly the name of the class. That means by convention, since our methods usually start with lowercase letters, but our class names start with capital letters, constructors will start with capital letters. The name of our constructor will be capital C car. So that's unique. Um, the other thing that makes constructors unique is con a constructor has no return type. And what I mean by that is not that it's void. I mean it literally doesn't have anything there at all. So not even void. Okay? When, we're, when we're typing it, there won't even be a return type there. We leave that out. So those are the two ways that constructors like certainly differ from, from regular methods. Um, we can have multiple constructors for a class, and we'll do that in a moment. So we'll capture that. Multiple constructors may be defined for a class. We could have only one constructor. Technically, we don't have to write any constructors. We can rely upon the Java compiler to write a default constructor for us. We usually don't want to do that, though. Um, and one thing that we're going to make a note of now to kind of like keep in mind, and we're going to explore this later. We're not going to worry about this today. One constructor, oops, construct, constructor may call another constructor with some restrictions, which we'll explore later. I just want to add that in there because we're used to one method calling another method. That's every line, every method we've written has done that. Um, and one constructor can call another constructor. There's just some restrictions we got to worry about. So we got to keep that in mind. All right. Um, so let's actually see what one of these looks like. Okay. So it's similar, but a little bit different than methods. We still have to specify the visibility. We want our constructor to be public. If our constructor was private, no one could create a new car. So like, what's the point, right? Um, so we'll make our constructor public. There is no return type. We don't put anything here. We immediately specify the name of the constructor, which is capital C car. And then we still need parentheses like we would with a method. This constructor won't have any parameters. If you put the return type in here, the Java compiler is going to treat this as a method called car and not as a constructor for the car class. And we're going to have some very odd bugs as a result. So leaving out void, leaving out the return type is super important. All right, we do need curly brackets. We're going to fill this in later, though. Just like we document all of our public methods, we're going to document our constructors as well. So we're going to do a slash star star java dot comment like we did yesterday. Um, and we're going to have a description here. A constructor that has no parameters has a special name. We call it the default constructor. Think of it this way. If you say, like, I want a new car, and you don't specify any additional information, you're going to get a default car. Okay. Um, so we're, we call this the default constructor, constructor for the car class. I think it's important, though, that we do document what do we mean by default, right? So a car has a certain fuel efficiency. A car has a certain amount of fuel in the tank. What are the default values? So let's, let's spell that out. So we're going to say initializes, initializes this car's 
fuel efficiency to 30 miles per gallon. So our default car, 30 miles per gallon. Um, the fuel in the tank to zero gallons. We don't start with any fuel. And the VIN to null. Okay, so we don't, we don't have a vehicle identification number yet. So we have methods to drive the car to get how much fuel is in the tank, to add fuel to the tank, to get and set the, the VIN. Um, we don't have any methods related to the fuel efficiency. So when we create a new car, what if this new car doesn't have a fuel efficiency of 30 miles per gallon? So we need some way that when we create a new car object, we can specify a different fuel efficiency. Um, but that's not something we need to change once we create the car. That's just determined when we actually create the car. So we're going to write another constructor that specifies this information. So type. The name of the constructor still has to be car, but now inside of our parentheses, we're going to specify a parameter for this additional information. It's going to be of type double. And we're going to call it initial fuel efficiency. So we could say new car, and I want a car with that gets 50 miles per gallon. If only it were that easy. It would be super cool. Uh, we need to document this as well. Um, so we're going to document, we're going to say this constructor, it constructs a new car object with the specified fuel efficiency. It's a pretty good description. Much like we did for our methods, um, if there are any parameters, we need to document each and every parameter. So we use the at param tag to tell Javadoc, hey, this comment, this documentation here relates to our parameter. We need to specify the name of the parameter, and then we can document it. Um, the initial fuel efficiency in miles per gallon, be good with our units, of this new car. So that's what step three is going to look like for us. We defined two constructors, um, the default constructor, and then a constructor that allows us to specify the fuel efficiency for the car. We wrote some new constructors here. So if you press Control J on Windows or Command J on the Mac, it will regenerate your documentation. And you can see that we now have constructors documented for our class, okay, which is super cool. Um, so let me switch to that really quick. Here's our generated documentation. There's now a constructor summary part. We can see the default constructor. We can see the constructor that takes initial fuel efficiency. I can click to it and see the details. All right. Run the bathroom. Um, so yeah, so th and then you can also toggle the documentation um, by clicking on this little menu in the upper right, um, where you can simply choose between documentation and um, the source code. So, oh yeah, so our documentation is updated. Things look pretty good. 